it's been let uh, go too long, and there needs to be a restructuring and, and a ch change in monetary policy. So from an economic point of view, I think we're at an inflection point. I think that China right now is at a juncture. And I, if I take the economic, the, the real problem is that the, the real estate debt problem and the local government debt problem has not been dealt with adequately yet. Uh, there needs to be a restructuring of uh, the debt. So if we look at uh, China, let's take the, the, the various sectors within China. The household sector, 70% of their savings is in real estate. That real estate's gone down. Stocks have gone down. Um, incomes um, ha are threatened. And so they're holding money in cash. And uh, so that's a problem. As far as government spending, which a lot of the economy is dependent on, um, about 83% of government spending is local government spending. And those local governments have gotten their money from uh, selling land and also borrowing money. They can't now make land sales, and they um, also uh, the borrowing is, is not going to work, and those who they borrowed from are going to continue to have problems. It's been let uh, go too long, and there needs to be a restructuring and, and a ch change in monetary policy. So from an economic point of view, I think we're at an inflection point. If that is not dealt with sooner, then there's the risk of something like a Japanese situation economically for that uh, period. So um, I think that that's what it looks like domestically. Internationally, again, I think um, the issue of taking manufacturing, going to the third world and using uh, technologies, the chips in the third world will be part of the plan. And I think that probably they'll continue to remain competitive in that. So those are the issues that have to be dealt with, I think. Now, just what I've said, it's the, it's the difficult process of restructuring debt. And it's a, a very difficult process, particularly at a politically sensitive time, because when you restructure debt, you're restructuring value. You, when you're, you, you're losing, when you write down some of the debt, you are uh, writing down some, some entity's assets. And so you have to, that challenging exercise of restructuring the debt and then also having a monetary policy that is conducive to not holding money in cash. There's a pushing on a string phenomenon in this part of the cycle. And so right now, when you have uh, deflation and you have an interest rate that is above the inflation rate, and you, uh, that is not only, it's the highest returning asset and it's the, the safest asset. You have to chase it out with a monetary policy in which interest rates are below the inflation rate, that the nominal bond yield is below the nominal growth rate. Otherwise, the debt continues to compound and become a problem. And you have to have a positive slope yield curve. And with that, you'll probably have to have some currency weakness, sort of the way the uh, Japanese have dealt with their debt problem. I think the greatest challenge of investors is now how to diversify well. Because if you look at the returns of asset classes and, and so on, so much is concentrated in, in how the U.S. market, and particularly the tech sector of the U.S. market, a limited number of companies have uh, performed well. So when you're looking at that, there's an equity. Everybody's long, and, and there's a long bias, and it's concentrated in those limited number of companies which, by the way, reflects a limited number of people and a limited and, and the, the whole issue of the wealth gap issue. But anyway, so when you're thinking about that, you have to think about how to diversify wealth. That's a whole other subject. But I think that uh, some issues like to think about uh, maybe inflation index bonds rather than normal bonds. I think there's some gold in the portfolio serves to diversify the portfolio so that if that, those other assets don't perform well, uh, there's better levels of diversification and also where you invest. Um, right now, I would say internationally, uh, I would say the three things that I look at is uh, as a country, um, just like individuals or companies, do they, uh, what's their income statement and balance sheet like? Do they earn more than they spend? And do they have assets, more assets than liabilities? That's going to be important in this time. 
what is their internal effectiveness? Do they have internal order or internal disorder? How effective are they are being um, uh, productive? And number three is, are they in the risk of an international conflict? I think that the neutral productive countries, so uh, if I was to look at that, I would say, as you look to ASEAN countries in this region, some of those, and India and so on, those are the countries that are uh, neutral in this and also have, uh, they're at the point where they have, they're at their takeoff point, they have enough capital to invest and become more productive. Uh, so diversification into those kinds of assets um, it should be a part of the people's portfolios, I believe. And you're saying that even if you were asked, you would not endorse either candidate right now. Why? Um, neither is what the country needs. Um, I, I want to, what the country needs is the moderates coming together to be able to work together and make great reforms. It needs a strong leader of the middle and to alienate the extremes. It, it, one extreme is going to have a war with the other extreme. Um, and what the country needs is uh, broad-based prosperity. One of the great issues that we look at is that the, um, there are different countries, there are two different countries going on, basically. Yeah. You could see it in the stock market, you could see it in the wealth, that it's a wonderful place to come up with the most brilliant ideas, the universities are the best universities in the world, and those talents create um, you know, great inventions and so on. But averages are misleading. So it's a small percentage of the population. If you look at the bottom 60% of the population, you have the average American, 60% of Americans have less than a sixth grade reading level. We have a situation where you can see it in the cities. You walk around the cities, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and so on. Um, uh, you smell, uh, smell marijuana, the kids are going to school high, the infrastructure's broken down, homeless people, yeah. um, crime and so on. Look at it. Do we have order? Uh, th there's only one thing that's needed, really, is broad-based prosperity. Broad-based prosperity. Yeah. No, I, I think people would have to surface and I would see it. I, all I know yeah. is that I, do, I don't see that. Okay. I, the, I ask everybody there is, is there a strong middle of compromise and dealing with these things together um, and, and then dealing with those issues? I, I, I don't see it. What I'm, what I'm referring to, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not clear, and I'm not meaning to paint anything in a black and white way. What I am saying is the United States is exceptional in its universities, in its inventiveness, in the, for a small percentage of the population that if you go to those places, or I looked at um, the stocks that have done exceptionally well. Look at the concentration in the markets, okay? It's a limited number of stocks in the world that have done very well. And so when we include averages, we have to keep that in mind. And if you look at the number of people, I calculated that in those companies, there's something like a million and a half people, half of which have immigrants who've come to the country who have done very well in those unique areas. But then you look at the majority and you look at, for example, education, PISA scores. I think the United States is something like 39th in PISA scores. There's, in other words, education level for the broad population. So an important thing to do is not confuse averages with exceptionalism. The exceptionalism has been in that domain, and it's really exceptional. But you need to have broad-based prosperity. When we talk about income, okay, and you talk about wealth, it comes from productivity. And that goes down to the individual level. So the, that individual will not be prosperous. They will have to have handouts, transfers of wealth, and so on. And, they, and there'll be all sorts of problems. If they're not productive, would, they'll have would, would the AI, drug problems. Would, they'll have other problems. Yeah. You have to have broad-based prosperity. Which, and it's very simple. Yeah, it, it exists in Singapore. It exists in certain things. What is the basics? The basics is that, very simple, um, do parents raise their children well so that they have a good education, good education not only in capabilities, but also 
in civility, how people behave? Do you come out to a society in which there is order and then opportunity, capital markets create, puts money in the hands of those who can be productive and that you have broad-based productivity. You should never have a situation where the population as a whole falls below a certain living standard. There are neighborhoods, <clears throat> I'm in Connecticut, my wife works to try to help uh, poor students in poor neighborhoods in Connecticut. In Connecticut, <clears throat> which is always one of the richest country, states in the country, 22% of the high school students um, have either dropped out of high school or are failing with absentee rates of greater than 25%. Wow. Okay, and, there, and there's crime and gangs and so on. Yeah. If I had to raise my children in that, live, in that place, I'd be a revolutionary. Yeah. So, that, so the condition, if you're, we're here in Singapore today, everybody gets a good education. And there's, and there's public housing that there's a standard and they mix it up. We have a problem in terms of the, the, that level of differences so, in, in opportunities. Yeah.